Kelly Davis, your host of the Untold Miracles podcast, and today I am so excited to be talking to the newly crowned Miss America and Children's Miracle Network Hospital's National Goodwill Ambassador, Miss Nia Franklin. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you on, and congratulations. You have now been on the job for, is it 16, 17 days now? Yeah, it'll be 21 days on Sunday. Oh, it's 21 days. Okay, so it was September 9th that you were crowned. Tell me what it feels like to be Miss America. It feels like an honor. It's a huge, huge honor. I am especially excited for this year, given the new direction and kind of the new things that Miss America is embracing, such as our social impact initiatives, I think are being more highlighted than ever before. And I'm really excited to be a part of this historic change with an organization. We're very excited because Children's Miracle Network Hospitals has had a very long-standing relationship with the Miss America organization. Some people don't understand that this is the world's largest scholarship program for women. And when you won Miss America, you also won $50,000 scholarship. And so it really is a blessing to be able to associate with the organization because together we've raised $17 million to help with scholarships and to help save kids' lives at children's hospitals across the country. So it truly is a win-win. And we are so excited to work with you this year as the National Goodwill Ambassador. But on this podcast, Nia, we talk about miracles. And I want to go back to September 9th, the day you were crowned Miss America, becoming the seventh Miss New York to win the title. I'm sure there were a lot of miracles along the way on your journey to becoming Miss America. But I want to start out when you were a little girl. Did you ever dream of becoming Miss America? I actually didn't. I always wanted to be a famous singer when I was a little girl, just like Whitney Houston. And that's kind of evolved over the course of my life and career. I just want to be a musician now. I want to earn a living by writing music and performing. That's my goal, ultimately. So as a little girl, I I watched the competition every now and then with my mom, if if she had it on or something like that. But I was kind of a tomboy when I was little, too. So I never dreamed I would be able to be Miss America until really just about three years ago when I actually decided it was something that I thought I could maybe do. Tell me how that dream came about. Well, I was in grad school in 2016. Well, 2015, I started that fall and uh, started looking for different scholarships, actually. I was looking into grants and different ways to put myself through my master's program because I had acquired a good amount of debt with my undergraduate degree, and I didn't want that to continue accumulating. And I came across uh, the Miss America organization, who I had known about already, obviously as a little girl. And then in my undergrad career, I actually had a lot of friends who were involved in the Miss North Carolina organization, which is a part of the Miss America organization. And I had a couple of friends that actually were fortunate enough to be crowned Miss North Carolina colleagues of mine that studied music with in school. But seeing them do that with a little bit of that seed, I think I needed of just that extra confidence of, you know, if these small town girls from North Carolina can go on and win that title, why can't I do it too? And I knew that the Miss America organization really valued talent as well as education. And those were two things that I was very passionate about. I was very passionate about my education and very passionate about the arts and music. And so that's when it kind of sparked me that I could try to become a part of this organization. And so I did my first local for, you know, to be, try to become Miss America in 2016. I'll never forget it. It was January 2nd, 2016. I did my first local Miss Miss Carolina and I lost. <laughs> so um, that was a learning experience, but that was really the seed. And from then on, I just continued to try and um, here I am today. After you lost your first competition was there any part of you that was discouraged or you like no next time I'm just gonna win it yes I was the talent winner that night although I did not place in that local competition and so I think even though it was a little discouraging because I really wanted to be Miss Metrolina that year it was also encouraging that I walked away with talent because I was told by a lot of people there that night that there are some girls that would just love to win that let alone the actual title. And so that kind of gave me the motivation to just continue to hone my interview skills, which at that time, I didn't understand how important the interview skills were for the job of Miss America. So I really worked hard on becoming a better communicator, being better with discussing my thoughts and my my personal beliefs in front of a panel of judges. 
And that's what kind of continued to push me because I'm a person that I don't really like to give up. Even if something doesn't work out for me the first time, I, I will never give up on something, especially if it's a dream line or a, a goal that I want to accomplish. I know when you were a freshman in college, you looked into the Miss America program because your dad had been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so there were some medical bills involved with that. So you were looking at other ways to pay for your schooling. Can you tell us about that experience your dad going through and then also you stepping up to be um, his donor? Yes. So I actually, still, when I was a freshman, I still wasn't quite confident enough to actually participate in the Miss America level organization. I don't even know if that, at that point it was necessarily on my radar, but I did do a local pageant that was not affiliated with Miss America that year. And it was just an on-campus kind of local a pageant for um, a fraternity that was hosting a scholarship organization, but the structure was very, very similar to Miss America. And I entered that because, A, I wanted to get more involved on campus, but I was looking for a, a way to just have a release or an outlet during that time because in a lot of ways, before I was called on to be a donor, I felt pretty helpless with my father's situation. Mm -hmm. I was away three hours from home and I was very, very adamant about getting my degree and making sure I got it within the four-year time frame, not to continue wasting, or not wasting money, but not to continue acquiring debt. And so I just wanted something to almost take my mind off of what was going on during that time. And so I did get involved with a, a scholarship pageant at that time. And um, it wasn't until my sophomore year that the doctors, my, my father had relapsed twice, and it was kind of getting hopeless. It really felt that way in, in a lot of ways. But as, as a woman of faith and having a mother of faith who's a strong woman of God, we kept, the, we kept the faith and we kept the hope. And the doctors decided that at that point, the best treatment would be a stem cell transplant. And so there were kind of two options. It was between myself and my, my dad's sister, my Aunt Julie. And my younger brother and sister were not eligible because you had to be 18 years of age. And the doctors decided after figuring out that I was a match, that I would just be the best over my aunt who was also, she could have done it for him as well, but she was, you know, she's a little older and they really preferred that for this type of procedure, they get someone very young, as young as possible. And I was 19. Mm -hmm. So that was really the best, the best direction for us to go in. And, um, I believe it was May 2nd. That was when the transplant happened, May 2nd of 2012. Now it's been, it's been about five years. Can you tell me a little bit more about that procedure? Is that painful? Did you have to be in the hospital for very long? Was it painful for your father to receive the transplant? It was about a week-long process for me. For my father, it was many, many months of, of healing and recuperation after the procedure. So for me, I, I, I guess I did the easy part compared to everything he had to go through. But it was about a week long, and it happened during kind of a hectic time. I was actually in the middle of finals week when they had to go in about an hour and a half away to the hospital where we did the procedure at Duke University Hospital, which is actually a CMNH hospital. And it was um, a procedure where they first had to inject me with different medicines to kind of prep my blood for the procedure. And it was very uncomfortable because you do feel very bloated with all the medicine pumping into your stomach, into your back. And after that, they hook you up to, and I get what's called a peripheral stem cell donation. There's three types. There's the umbilical cord, there is the peripheral, and then there is the actual bone marrow where they dig into your bones, which I did not have to do. But I do remember when they first told me getting really nervous about that one because that one can be even more painful. But what they did with mine is they hooked me up to a dialysis machine, so to speak. They took blood from one arm, uh, my left arm, and then filtered it over my head to, to actually uh, take those and harvest those stem cells. And then they filtered the blood back into me so that I wasn't losing too much blood. But I do remember on the very last day, it was about a three-day process of just filtering blood. Uh, I'll be on the machine pretty much, um, you know, for anywhere from four to five hours. And then I would have the day off. But that third day, I remember just needing to use the restroom. And I, I will never forget waking up. And not knowing, you know, what had just happened. I was on the floor and I just started crying because it was like I had never faced it before. And it was very scary for me. But um, it was it was really something that compared to what my father was suffering through. I mean, I would, I would do it for him as many more times as he needed because it, he's been 
doing so well now. He is still a little stiff because he was very, he was on bed rest kind of for about a year and a half, two years, which can be very hard to, you, it can be very difficult to regain your flexibility after that. So he's still working on that side of things, but he's walking. There was a point where he really couldn't even walk. Uh, his kidneys were failing. He was a, a doctor told him that he was going to have to be on dialysis the rest of his life. And he actually laughed in Dr. Space when, when uh, they told him that because he just had so much faith that he would get better as well. I was really fortunate and I got to meet your mom and dad during the Miss America competition. They randomly were staying at our hotel. So we were able to give them some rides back and forth from the hotel. Oh, and wow. so I got to know them well. I got to know you well through them. And just talking to your mom, it truly is a miracle that your dad is where he is today. And I told her that your mom's Chrissy. I told her that she should write a book about the miracle of your dad's journey, the miracle of you becoming Miss America. There's just so many weird miracles that have happened in your life and when she started to tell me the little tiny details about that I was just blown away but I also love how as you mentioned your family you're a family of faith and you believe in God and a higher power and it it truly was really remarkable for her to share all of those little tiny miracles with me. But one thing that I really appreciate about you is the fact that you have a certain level of compassion for the kids treated at Children's Miracle Network hospitals. There's 10 million that go into Children's Hospital throughout the year, and you know what that's like. You were in their shoes. You may not have had the same type of experience, but you know what it's like to feel scared and to not know what's going to happen. Tell me how that experience changed you as far as really having the desire to, you know, connect with our kids and do more to give back to our organization. Absolutely. Well, I know that when I was in the situation with my father, I actually felt a sense of guilt, basically thinking to myself, you know, worst case scenario, if this procedure doesn't work and for some reason my father doesn't make it because your your immune system is basically wiped out when you receive a stem cell transplant so that the new one can kind of go in. And it can make, it can be very hard on your body because you're essentially, you have no defense like against diseases and and um, it can be very difficult and just harsh on the body to receive a stem, a stem cell transplant and then you have to kind of heal after that. And I just remember feeling like it's going to be my fault if for some reason my mm. father didn't make it or anything like that. And I also know that a lot of children when they're sick could also really feel that same sense of guilt as far as, you know, if I if I don't make it, my parents are going to be very sad or anything like that. And I just want children to know that it's not their fault that this is happening to them. And I just want them to have hope for their situation no matter what. It is because there truly are miracles through modern medicine and even through keeping up with your faith and just believing that God can heal you in your body, no matter what type of illness you have. I think it's important for people to have just a sense of hope when it comes to these situations. I want to know, is your dad recovering from cancer the biggest miracle that you've witnessed in your life, or is there another miracle you'd like to share? That's probably the biggest miracle I've witnessed through someone else, and he's so close to me. Um, and so that's a huge act of faith and, and uh, something that was just a huge part of my life. But I also think it's a miracle that, I'm, that I am Miss America because, as I said, this is nothing I dreamed of really growing up. And even the fact that I'm 25, but as you may know, the old age limit for Miss America was 17 to 24. And so I give credit to God that the age limit was actually raised this year, right when I, you know, I turned 25 back in, in um, July of this year. And here I am where a a year ago, this would not have been possible. Mm. And so that's a miracle because I mean, what are the chances that I would happen to move to New York? And then three months later, I hear the news that they've raised the age by one year. And so for me, I I really took that as a sign, even though I didn't know if, you know, I I lost my state competition last year in North Carolina and moved here to start a kind of a new life and and really move on into my career. And I decided maybe this is a sign that I should try one more time. And in the the moment, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to be married because just because they raised the age limit. But it's funny how I decided to just kind of give it a try. And I listened to my conscience and to what I felt like the signs were pointing to and the direction that God wanted my life to go. And it actually ended up happening. That to me is is really a miracle and and kind of a testament to just never giving up and not letting any opportunity pass you by. 
I kind of want you to tell our listeners about the job of Miss America because a lot of people don't realize that it's a job and it's a lot of work. And so I want you to tell our listeners what you're looking forward to about your job this year and what impact that you want to remember it for in your reign as Miss America. I want to be remembered for using my passion to fuel my goals and to fuel my aspirations. And my passion is music 100%. That's what I've always wanted to do in my life. And it's funny how even though I didn't dream of being Miss America growing up, the dream I kind of had for myself to be a musician and to be a famous singer, it's kind of happening now in a way. And I'm using that, that passion to, to be, to make a difference in this organization and in the world. And I'm really hoping to continue being an advocate for the arts by partnering with organizations such as Sing for Hope and, and other artistic based organizations around our country. But also I'm really looking forward to doing a benefit concert where we could give money back to the Children of Miracle Network Hospitals and Miss America so that people can see that the arts really do have an impact, not just in schools, but even in our communities by helping to, to raise money for things that are really important in our communities. Well, I definitely want to attest to the power of music. I have a nephew, and he's 22, and he doesn't have any language. He's severely autistic, and music is really the way that he communicates. He will sit at a piano and just play certain notes for like eight hours at a time, but music is everything to him. And so it really is important that music is in our hospitals and is in our communities because it is a way where we can connect with one another, especially showing each other that we have love for one another. I want to talk to you about some of the challenges that come with the job of being Miss America. What are some of the things that, even though you're only 21 days in, what are some of the challenging things that people might not know? Yeah, and I think life would be boring if you didn't have challenges and adversity and things that you had to overcome. And um, I mean, one challenge of, of Miss America is, that people may not realize is it's not a fairy tale job where you get to do whatever you want, whenever you want, you have a schedule, you have a very intense calendar of events. Sometimes I'm in in one city one day and then 24 hours I'm in another city. And I know there'll be a lot of times where I'm in a, I'm living out of a suitcase for months at a time where I, before I can even get back to my apartment to, to get, you know, a new set of clothes. I might be getting things dry cleaned on the road. And that can be difficult for someone that is, is a, like a, I like to call myself kind of a homebody. I'm not the girl that likes to go out all the time and go to dinner. Like I'd rather just stay home and order in and have watch a good movie. Right, right. <laughs> so that's something that's something that for me may, may be challenging this year. But I'm also very excited about meeting new people all around our state or I'm sorry, our country. And and also, um, you know, there's early mornings. I I consider myself a night owl. <laughs> so it's not the fairy tale life where you can just wake up whenever you want and you know, sleep in, it's, it's a job and you're up at 8 a.m., 7 a.m., sometimes even 5 a.m. if you have to be somewhere at 8. So it's, um, it's important to keep that in mind. And especially with the new direction that Miss America is going in, I'm the first Miss America 2.0. And so I have a responsibility to really embrace those changes, which I'm happy to do. And I'm so, I'm so thrilled already the opportunities that have come my way with kind of the rebranding of the organization. And so I just want to make sure that I kind of set the precedent going forward for the, the future Miss Americas to know that it's okay to embrace changes. And and with those changes, a lot of good can come out of them. Well, yes, I know in the press conference after you were crowned Miss America, they had talked about the recent changes and getting rid of the swimsuit competition, which was a good thing for you because you said you like to eat and you embraced that <laughs> change. And I thought that was Absolutely. really funny. But I want to talk to you quickly about your talent. So I was sitting next to the judges that night, sitting right next to Randy Jackson and Bobby Bones. Oh, wow. And the judges said in the press conference afterwards that they were not supposed to have any facial expression when you performed your talent. <laughs> and honestly, when you opened your mouth, and I'd been talking to your mom that week, so I knew to expect, like, I hadn't heard you perform, but I knew it was going to be pretty pretty great. But when you opened your mouth, they both went back in their chairs, their jaws dropped. And it was just crazy, amazing to hear your voice. And your mom on Thursday leading up to it had sent me a video that you had done of a song that you'd produced. And so I know you do a lot of different type of genres of music. You blew everyone Mm -hmm. away with your opera. But what was really fun for me is at the press conference, they talked to you about 
your music and how you've been singing since you were a little girl actually wrote your first song at five years old. And I would love for you to share that song with us right now, if you don't mind. Okay, awesome. All right, here we go. This song is called Love. I guess I've never really named it, but I guess now I'll name it. (laughs) I read it when I was five. Love, 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 love is the only thing that matters to me. Hey, 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 hey. When I wake up in the morning and I see the shining sun, I thank the Lord above for all the things that he has done. Love, 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 love is the only thing that matters to me. Oh my goodness, I love it so much. That was so fun to see everyone at the press conference have the biggest smile on their face listening to that song. (laughs) And I'm so excited for your dreams, Nia, with music. I know you want to win a Grammy or multiple Grammys. Tell me... Yes, um, hopefully one day. Who is your biggest mentor in music beyond Whitney Houston? I have so many artists that I really admire their love. I mean, their, their music. But I would say the biggest influence on me as far as my composition in general from R&B songs that I may write or inspirational songs, all the way to the classical genres and the different melodies that I come up with for even operas or symphonies that I write. I would say it's Stevie Wonder because his melodies are so pure and his songs are so filled with love and just positivity. Mm -hmm. Uh, But also, he can be lighthearted sometimes in his music, but he can also be very thoughtful and and pensive in his music. And I admire all of those qualities. And he he has such a prolific he's such a prolific songwriter and musician and um he's he's really just um a, a musical one of my musical heroes and also janelle Monae, who mm. also really loves stevie mm. wonder so it kind of makes sense that i would uh, really admire her as well i would like to know what you would tell young girls or young women who are considering um competing for their local competition what words of wisdom would you give to them i would tell them to find their purpose And not just within the Miss America organization, but find their purpose in life. What is it that they want to do when they grow up? What is it that they want to go to school for and study? Because if you have that in the back pocket, if you know exactly what you want to do, and even if you don't have all of the details figured out, think about it. And that will lead you to picking a social initiative impact that you really, really are close to. I believe your social impact initiative should be something that you kind of live already, not something you just randomly choose. And so if you can find a purpose behind why you're doing it and why you're going to even compete for a local title, that will make the process so much more authentic. And it will eventually, essentially, I'm sorry, make it an easier uh, and more fun time in your life. My last question, I ask this to all of our guests. If there were three miracles that you could create in the world today, what would that look like for you? I would love to have no more natural disasters. Mm. That's been pretty (laughs) tough lately, given everything happening in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that have been affected by the storms. um, And so it's been very saddening for me to watch. Thankfully, everyone I know is safe. And so I count that as a blessing. Mm -hmm. And my family did not go through any of this type of damage because they're not on the coast. But Mm -hmm. my heart really goes out to my friends and that and my friends, you know, that live in that area, even where I went to school, East Carolina, they experienced some some of the effects of um, the hurricane, the recent hurricane. But also I would I could like wave my magic wand or create a miracle. I would love every school in our country to have a, just a wonderful arts program. It's something that I'm fighting for now, and I'm, I plan on lobbying on Capitol Hill come March to restore and continue the funding that, that schools receive and the NEA receives. So that would be really great because there, it's just really saddening also to, to think about and to even see firsthand some of the schools in our country that just don't have the budget to, to provide their students with a quality arts education and a well-rounded education. I would also like to get rid of, you know, the different diseases and things like that. I mean, I, at the same time, like I said earlier, if without kind of hardships and things, life would be boring. But, I mean, I know having to watch my dad and others who have actually lost family members to illnesses, it can be very hard to watch. But I think the closest thing we can get to miracles right now are getting, you know, having regular doctor's visits and just trying to keep ourselves healthy um, in any ways that we can. 
Thank you so much, Nia. I really appreciate your time. We are so excited to work with you this year as our National Goodwill Ambassador. And we have our first hospital visit scheduled in a couple weeks. It's going to be October 15th in Orange County at Children's Hospital of Orange County. We're going to meet some amazing kids, visit Seacrest Studios, hopefully perform for the kids while we're in the hospital. And it's going to be really great. But there's going to be so many things we're doing together throughout the year. But we are so grateful to you. We're so grateful to the Miss America organization for the millions of dollars raised and we really look forward to a really great year together. So thank you for being a guest. Thank you so much. Looking forward to next week and to the rest of the year. Today's podcast is brought to you by Walmart and Sam's Club. Want to be a part of 1 billion raised to help kids live better? Give to your local Children's Miracle Network hospital when you check out at a Walmart or Sam's Club before September 30th. Together, Walmart and Sam's Club are nearing 1 billion raise for Children's Miracle Network hospitals since 1987, and we need your help to get there. Give today, and thank you.